Well, good morning, folks. My name is Holger Neubauer. I'm the preacher of the Church of Christ at Lakeshore in South Haven, Michigan. We meet at the corner of County Road 380 and M140. And uh, we'd like to invite you to our services at 11 a.m. on Sunday. We have a Bible class on radio on Sunday morning on Cozy 103.7 FM. If you have iHeart Radio, you can tune in and be with us. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about a phrase, a device um, that's literary in its nature, which is referred to as an prolepsis. Now, a prolepsis is a device that speaks of an event as if it has already been accomplished, though it was in the process of being accomplished. You've heard of the phrase, a dead man walking. Well, we don't really mean that he's dead while he's walking. We mean that the results are inevitable. He's a man on death row. He's a dead man walking. Well, in the Bible, we have this concept. Sometimes we call it the already, but not yet. It is the declaring of an event as if it were already accomplished because the results are inevitable. And we find this uh, prolepsis, or these prolepses, I believe that's the plural form of the, of the term, found all over the Bible. For instance, in the Old Testament, God called Abraham a father of many nations. We find that in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 2. Also Genesis chapter 15, and verse 5, and yet that was before Isaac was born. Well, how could he have been the father of many nations before he had any children? Well, Paul would say in Romans chapter 4, verse 17, he calls those things which do not exist as though they did, because the result was inevitable. And so God told Israel, I have given you the city of Jericho, Joshua 6 and verse 2. So it was kind of a done deal, but they had to go into the city and take it by faith. And the walls, of course, were encompassed about on the seventh day seven times. And the Bible says the walls came down by faith, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30, which demonstrates the nature of faith. God speaks, man hears, man obeys. And so this already but not yet, this prolepsis, is what I, I want to get into this morning as we look to the salvation message of the Bible. Because the New Testament is chock filled with it. And the message is presented as if it was accomplished, though it was being accomplished. For instance, the kingdom of God, which has one overarching meaning. It means God's rule in the hearts of his coveted people. That's what the kingdom of God is. That's what it was in the Old Testament in a physical way. That's what it is today. God's rule in the hearts of men in a covenant body of people. Now that kingdom, Jesus said, would come incremental. It would come as a small seed, which Jesus said was the smallest of all the seeds. And it would become a great plant where the birds of the air would nest into its branches in Matthew 13, 31 and 32, referencing the Gentiles coming into the kingdom, meeting the Lord also in the air. And the kingdom, Jesus said, was like three measures of meal where a woman would take leaven and put it in three specific measures until they were all filled with a leaven. Well, leaven has a very uh, steady um, but significant influence on any piece of dough that it's going to affect. Well, that's the way that the kingdom of God affected the ancient world. Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world, that's the way that the kingdom uh, was established. Now, 
they were in the kingdom, according to Colossians 1, verse 13, in its seed form. And yet, in Hebrews 12, in verse 28, they were receiving the kingdom. And yet, the kingdom, in some sense, was still in their future. Now, in Luke 21, verse 31, Jesus said, When you see these things taking place, know the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. And that's the only time that Jesus spoke about the kingdom with a specific event, and he was surely speaking about the destruction of Jerusalem there. Even our futurist friends would agree with that, at least most of them would. So, but many of our brothers believe that the word kingdom is used in a completely different way that Jesus would use the word kingdom in Mark 9, 1. Some of you shall not taste of death until you see the kingdom of God come with power, which they believe that Jesus is pointing to Pentecost. But he's not pointing to Pentecost. Mark 8, 38 belongs with Mark 9, 1. When Jesus says, some of you will not taste of death, he means many of you will. And he was referring to the consummation of the kingdom. And Luke 21, 31 is not speaking of the kingdom in a different way, but, real, but rather in a different stage. The completion of the same kingdom. How many kingdoms does the Lord have? And the kingdom has one basic connotation. God's rule in the hearts of men through a covenant. And so the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, then cometh a salvation strength and the kingdom. Revelation 11, 15, then the kingdoms of this world be, will become the kingdom of our God. The transition would be over. The kingdom would be consummated. And when Daniel prophesied in Daniel 2 and verse 44 about an everlasting kingdom that would never be destroyed, he was referencing the consummation of the kingdom, not the beginning, because it would overtake the same land mass that the Babylonian kingdom was occupying, that the Medan Persians would occupy, the Grecians would occupy, then finally the Romans would occupy. Well, that wasn't occupied on Pentecost. It was occupied when the gospel increased. Well, that's the way the kingdom increased until the kingdom was consummated. And in order to have a kingdom, you have to have a rule. And the only way you have a standard of rule through a kingdom is to manifest the law. And that law of the kingdom was not, manif not manifest on the cross, nor was it manifest uh, at Pentecost wasn't written down properly adjudicated. The Gentiles hadn't even come in. And so the kingdom needs the completed revelation. And that kingdom is going to come at the time that Jerusalem fell, proven by Luke 21, 31. So they're in the kingdom. They're receiving a kingdom. And yet the kingdom is coming. They're in the kingdom as far as the promises are concerned, in the seed form. They're in the beginning stages of it, and yet it's not completed. So they're in it, they're receiving it, and yet the kingdom is coming. That's the way it was with the salvation message as well. The Bible says, by grace are you saved. Ephesians 2 and verse 8. Yet Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13 that they were waiting for the grace that was to be brought at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, was the grace of 1 Peter 1.13 a different nature of the grace that's spoken about in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8? No. It's the same kind of grace that the Bible is speaking about, the favor of God. It would be completed at the revelation of Jesus. And so they were saved by grace. Salvation had been granted to them, and yet salvation was coming. So Jesus would appear a second time without sin unto salvation. Then comes uh, salvation, strength, and the kingdom. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. It's simply the process of taking place uh, through the new covenant world. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 2, they were being saved. So let's notice what we have. They were saved, Ephesians 2, 8. They were being saved, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2, and yet salvation was coming. They're in the kingdom. They're receiving the kingdom, and yet the kingdom was coming. When would the kingdom be consummated? In Luke 21, 31, when Jerusalem fell. 
when you see these things come to pass, know the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 1, that he would judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Well, it's the same kingdom of Luke 21, 31. Jesus was coming in judgment in Luke 21, verse 27. He was coming in clouds with power and great glory. So we fail to see how the uh, nature of salvation is not completed any more than the kingdom is completed on the day of Pentecost. And again, there are no, Jew, no Gentiles in the kingdom for at least 12 years, so it couldn't have been completed. You remember, Peter was given the keys of the kingdom. He opened the doors for the church, the kingdom, in Acts chapter 2 for the Jews, and Acts chapter 10 for the Gentiles. That's 12 years after the fact. And so the kingdom is increasing until the kingdom is consummated. And then, of course, that's when heaven would be opened. And I just did a video last week on that subject. You can check it out if you haven't uh, seen it yet. So let's talk about the subject of redemption. Again, my contention is, is that the kingdom, uh, which was manifest in its seed form, was being experienced by the Jewish church on the day of Pentecost, but it was also being received, Hebrews 12, 28, and yet they were looking forward to it in their future. Same thing with salvation. They were saved, they were being saved, and salvation was coming. He would appear a second time without sin unto salvation, and that coming was in a very, very little while, Hebrews 10, 37, and those are different comings. They are the same coming, the second coming of Christ. Let's talk a little bit about redemption. How was the church, the early church, redeemed? Of course, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So redemption comes through the sacrifice of Christ, through his blood, in whom we have redemption. And yet, the Apostle Paul speaking to the church at Ephesus, and this is important, speaks about the church being sealed. Notice what he says in verse 13 of Ephesians 1. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And by the way, Paul makes a distinction between the we Jews and you Gentiles throughout Ephesians chapter 1 and chapter 2. And in chapter 2 and verse 11, he will say, therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh. So it's the we Jews, not the we apostles, the we Jews, the you Gentiles. So he says in verse 12, we first trusted in Christ. Those are the Jews. In whom you also, Gentiles, trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now they were sealed in the same way that they were sealed in 2 Corinthians 1, 21, 22, and 23, where the sealing, the anointing, and the guarantee are all synonymous expressions for the miraculous pouring out of the Spirit. They were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee, the Greek word Arabon. Reneker and Rogers has an interesting comment on this and suggests that the ancients used it as an engagement ring. And so it was a promise of what was to come. What was to come? The completion of their redemption. So he says, um, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Now what's the purchased possession? To these same Ephesians, Paul spoke to the elders at Ephesus, Miletus in Acts 20 and verse 32. He tells them that they are to take heed to themselves and unto all the flock, over the which the Holy, uh, Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit had made them overseers, to feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. What had Jesus purchased? He purchased the church. With what? His blood. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. And so they are sealed as the guarantee that that process would continue. That it would be completed. And there's only one purchased possession. 
I have debated two men who took the position, this has to be the physical body. And I ask one, is the physical body going to be redeemed by the blood of Christ at the end of time, though he believes it's going to be redeemed at the end of time somewhere? He said, no. Well, then what's it going to be redeemed with? You see, the redemption of Christ comes through his own sacrifice. And the New Testament itself is a blood-sealed covenant. And the first tabernacle is sprinkled by blood, Hebrews 9, verse 21. And so is the second one, the spiritual tabernacle, the church, which God himself pitched, Hebrews 8 and verse 2, which itself is proleptically spoken of in the New Testament. And so there's this already but not yet element. Again, in Ephesians 1, 7, they're redeemed through the sacrifice of Christ. Now they're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the down payment, the guarantee, until such time the redemption would be completed. And the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, that they were sealed into the day of their redemption. And the word into is the Greek word ice. And ice always is prospective in its nature. In Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we find the word for is the Greek word ice. It's prospective. The blood of the New Testament was given for many for the remission of sins. Ice, prospective. It's prospective here. So they have the sealing of the Holy Spirit, the guarantee that full redemption would be granted. And it was about to be granted. The glory was about to be revealed. And the redemp they were looking forward to the redemption of their body and their adoption of sons. They weren't looking for the adoption of their physical body. They were looking for the completion of the adoption for the sons in the body that was changing. And of course, that's the church. Now, my position is that the kingdom is the church. And the kingdom increased? Well, the church increased. The kingdom is the church, and the church is the tabernacle. And yet the tabernacle was pitched by God, his own tabernacle. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 2. But in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3, the tabernacle of God is with man. It's the completion of the kingdom. Then comes salvation, strength, and the kingdom. It's the completion of the tabernacle. It's the completion of the church. God has one kingdom. My futurist friends tell us that premillennialism is false, and yet they have the kingdom still in their future in so many passages. They just need to be honest about it. Alexander Campbell was a post-millennialist. Barton Stone, pre-millennialist. The early church was uh, weaning themselves off of these doctrines, and we need to wean ourselves completely off any futures view, because the kingdom is completely present with us today. We are no longer sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. We don't need the miraculous operation of the sealing because the kingdom is complete. The tabernacle is complete. Salvation is complete. Jesus returned a second time without sin and to salvation. Again, and that, um, that coming was uh, at hand at the time that James wrote James 5, 8, and 9. It's the same second coming. All right. So let's talk about the concept now of uh, resurrection, shall we? In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible speaks about those individuals who were made alive, who were dead in trespasses in sins. Now, if someone is dead and they're made alive, someone had to be raised. Someone had to be resurrected. And of course, he's talking not about biological resurrection. Here is he in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. And you, he made alive, who were dead in trespasses in sins. And yet, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, the Bible says, And raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So they were raised up. How were they raised up? Of course, they obeyed the gospel. 
What's the gospel? Well, the fundamental elements of the gospel are the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. They obey the form of that doctrine, then being made free from sins. And so they identified with the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ in their baptism. They were raised into the heavenlies. And yet, as they were raised into the heavenly places, they weren't meeting Jesus in the physical clouds, were they? I don't think so. And yet, they were already raised into the heavenly age. That is, they began to be raised, you see. And the Bible teaches in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, Paul says, He shall raise us up and present us with you. Again, it's the Jewish we and Gentile you. So he's looking forward, not to a biological resurrection, but to a kind of a resurrection where there is an equality. The Ephesians were already raised. They were being raised. They're looking forward to the end of their resurrection, just like they're looking, looking forward to the end or completion of their kingdom and their redemption. And that resurrection would take place when the dead ones were raised and true covenant life was given to the people. And so the resurrection has an already but not yet element uh, to it. Now, again, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, shall raise us up and present us with you. That's Jew-Gentile theme in that particular uh, instance. Well, that's exactly what Paul speaks uh, about to the Philippians. He speaks about this stage of resurrection. Now, Paul says he wants to attain the resurrection from the dead. That's uh, Philippians chapter 3 in verse 11. But I want you to notice carefully what he says in verse 16 of Philippians chapter 3. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, what had they attained? In the same context, he was speaking about attaining to the resurrection of the dead ones. Now, if this is a biological resurrection at the end of time, and Paul says, to the degree that I have already attained, then his physical body would have already been transformed miraculously halfway. But, but you see, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that now, out of the covenant of death, I have attained resurrection of the dead ones, all right? The old covenant Jews. And one day, when the dead ones who were in Hades were raised, the resurrection would be completed and the new age would have been consummated. So when he says in Philippians 3, verse 21, who will transform our lowly body, body of our humiliation, He's not speaking about a physical body. He's speaking about a mystery of changing the old covenant world into the new covenant world. Now, what is the mystery? Well, the mystery is bringing Jew and Gentile into one body. We want to read a couple of passages here in Ephesians chapter 3. So he says, verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 3, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages, which was not made known, has now been revealed by his spirit to his holy apostles and prophets that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body. Now, that's the mystery. How the Gentiles would attain equality with the Jews, raised in the same body, raised up together. All right, that's what Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6 says. And so Paul speaks about the same subject of the mystery of the Jew and Gentile being fellow takers in the same body. And again, there's an already but not yet element of this Jew-Gentile relationship. Now, here is the already element. Remember, the kingdom increases, salvation increases, grace increases, the revelation increases. Everything has this already but not yet element when it comes to salvation and redemption in the New Testament. So in Colossians 3 and verse 11, he says, Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Now that phrase, all and in all, 
means both Jew and Gentile in equality. That's the connotative meaning of the term. Every time you see that phrase in the New Testament, it has the same connotation to the Ephesians, Paul says, that Christ was the head of the church, which is his body. And there's one body that has to do with salvation, the fullness of him that fills all in all. To the early Christians, that was a unifying phrase. It meant both Jew and Gentile in one body, in one covenant that was changing, you see. As the Gentiles came in, they're not under the law. But as the Jews come in, they're still under the law. That's why Paul is participating with animal sacrifices in Acts chapter 21. So that law will not end, though they're both participating with the gospel. That law is not going to end until that temple ends where they could no longer participate with the sacrifices. And by the way, Paul participates with animal sacrifices in Acts 21, 25 uh, years after Pentecost. So Gentiles are coming in. They're not under the law. The Jews come in. They're first. They're still under the law. Now, the diet laws are qualified, right? But there's a question how they're qualified. That's what Romans 14 is all about. 2 Corinthians 8 is all about. To respect the Jewish conscience in these matters without Judaizing and making the Gentiles partake with them. That's what that whole discussion is within uh, Romans chapter 14 and uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So, we find this phrase, all and in all, means Jew and Gentile. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we find in verse 42, it is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. The Jews argue that the law is going to continue. All right. Well, if the law is going to continue, then the body of Judaism will continue. But Paul says, no, it's sown in corruption. It is being raised already in incorruption. They were being raised, Ephesians 2 and verse 6. And the Jews in 1 Corinthians 15, and they are Jews who are the false teachers, are making the argument that the law is going to continue. No, no, Paul says. The law comes to an end, then comes to the end. And he says that the strength of sin is the law in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56. He's not talking about a biological body here. The false teachers ask the question, what body do they come? Plural pronoun, singular subject. What the false teachers denied is that the Jews coming out of Hades would then have equality with the Gentiles. What they argued was that the Gentiles can go to Hades where Jesus already cleansed them and they're going to be Jews for the rest of eternity. But no, that old covenant body was sown in corruption. It was being raised in incorruption, and soon the change would come. So Paul says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. And Paul includes himself in the category of some of the Corinthians that were living at that time. I show you a mystery. And what's the mystery? We just read from Ephesians chapter 3. The mystery is putting Jew and Gentile in one body. We shall not all sleep. Sleep is an appropriate uh, uh, designation for a temporary place of rest, and that's what Hades was. It was their temporary place. Heaven is the long home. That's a long place. So we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Again, that's not a miraculous change at the end of time. It's a spiritual change at the time of the end. They would all be changed. The change was already um, uh, taking place. Notice, please, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed, being changed, present tense verb, into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. They were being changed. Soon the change would come. Again, now notice what we've discovered. They're in the kingdom. They're receiving the kingdom. The kingdom's coming. They're saved by grace. They're receiving grace. Grace is coming. They're redeemed. 
They were sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of their redemption, so they were being redeemed. They now were raised, and resurrection was coming, you see. And when the dead ones would be raised, then it would come to pass the saying, um, uh, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, Hades, where is your victory? And he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 25. And Isaiah chapter 25 is a context in which the uh, desolate city would never be rebuilt. Just read Isaiah 25, 2 sometime, along with Isaiah 25, 8, and you find that that death of that covenant was being destroyed. And the same thing with Isaiah chapter 28. But back to this phrase, all and in all. Again, Jew, Gentile, inequality. Well, let's notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 28. So he says, uh, yes, now when all things are made subject to him, and again, all things are put under his feet, verse 27. Now all things are made subject to him. It's not a different nature of the things subject to Christ. It's the completion of the same thing. Like the kingdom is completed. Like salvation is completed. It's not a different nature. It's the same nature. It's the completion of the covenant. That's what it's all about. That God may be all and in all. So now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in and all. Now what's the connotative meaning of all and in all? What does Colossians chapter 3 and verse 11 say? It means Jew and Gentile in equality. And when the law ended, the equality would come. And we know that the law didn't end at the cross. Because in Acts chapter 21, we have apostolic approval of the participation of animal sacrifices 25 years after Pentecost, which Paul could not possibly have done for influence sake if the law had ended at the cross. No one is at liberty who is a Christian today to participate with animal sacrifices. I don't care if there's a temple in Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem for influence sake to participate with animal sacrifices, you are denying the sacrifice of Christ. But Paul wasn't because that old age was coming to an end. Now you remember the context of Acts chapter 21. Who urged him to do that? The elders of the church at Jerusalem did, along with James, an apostle. And then the thousands of Jews who were zealous, who were believers, who were also zealous of the law. The law had to operate. There's no other explanation. The law had not been nailed to the cross. Their guilt and sins had been nailed to the cross or to the, to the tree. <laughs> but the law had not died. And I explained that in another video. So here we have the already, Colossians 3 verse 11 of all being in all. And then we have the not yet, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse uh, 28. Well, let's talk a little bit about death, shall we? It's the same thing. And uh, incidentally, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, there are present tense verbs, which the King James uh, puts as uh, past tense verbs, and uh, it's caused confusion. Robert Young, wrote his, his literal translation because of the King James Version. And I want you to notice what he said. He was a great, great scholar, self-made scholar. And uh, this is what Robert Young says in response to the King James Version. Now, he believed that the Texas Receptus, that is the Greek text which underlies the King James Version, was a pure text, and it is a pure text, by the way. But that doesn't mean that the translators had a good translation every time that they translated from a pure Greek text. Matter of fact, they did not um, honor the tenses of the verbs in many instances. Now, I want you to notice what Robert Young says. If a translation gives a present tense when the original gives a past, or a past when it is a present, or a perfect for a future, or a future for a perfect, or an A for a the, or a the for an A, uh, 
or a noun for a verb, it is clear, or a subjunctive for an imperative, it is clear, he says, that verbal inspiration is as much overlooked as if it had no existence. The word of God is made void by the traditions of men. And amen to that. You ought to get yourself a KJ3, Young's Literal, or the Literal Concordant Version. Uh, Brent Bischel and I were at Baker Bookhouse about a year ago. And uh, Brent uh, likes to collect Bibles and he uh, rebinds Bibles. Brent uh, has rebound my Bible. He's done just a great, great, great job. I appreciate him a lot. And he came upon this concordant literal version. And if everyone would read this version, we wouldn't have any futurists because the coming of the Lord was about to take place. The law was being done away. It was being abolished. It was passing away. And I want you to notice what he says in Ephesians chapter 1, 13 and 14, a text which we're talking about redemption. They were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the redemption of the purchased possession. Notice what he says. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is an earnest of the enjoyment of our allotment to the deliverance of what has been procured already taking place. What a wonderful translation. You ought to get a copy. He's talking about the redemption of the purchased possession. It had already started. It would be completed. I want you to notice something about the kingship of Christ. The already but not yet. Um, Hebrews chapter 7, 12 and 13. Notice what uh, the literal concordant version says. For the priesthood being transferred, present tense verb, of necessity there is coming to be a transference of law also. Not what the King James Version says. The translators were biased. And yes, the translators of the King James Version were biased. I know that because those same men, 20 years later, made adult rebaptism illegal. Now you figure out they're honest men or not, okay? Don't let them tell you what the tense of the verbs are. Now notice what he says here. There's coming to be a transference of law also. For he of whom these things are said partakes of a different tribe from which no one has been he to the altar. For it is taken for granted that our Lord has risen out of Judah, to which tribe Moses speaks nothing concerning priests. And so the law was being transferred. His kingship was increasing. His kingship was increasing until such time he's crowned the king. Well, when he was crowned the king, Zechariah 14 and verse 9, in that day there will be one king over all of the earth. What day? When the houses are rifled and the women are ravished and Jerusalem is besieged. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 2. And Zechariah 14 speaks about the day of battle when the nations come against Jerusalem. Again, Houses rifled, women ravished, that's national judgment language, that's when Jesus returned, and that's when he was called king over all the earth. If the kingdom is consummated at the fall of the temple, which Luke 21 and 31 and Revelation 12 and 10 teach, then why isn't his kingship consummated as well? Why doesn't it grow through the covenant? Of course it does, and that's what the revealing of Christ is all about. The revealing of his kingship to all over the world. And God was going to rule the world until the gospel went to all the world. And it had to go to the Jewish diaspora in order for uh, the end to take place. So, let's notice where we are here. We're studying the prolepsis. The already but not yet. God calls those things which do not exist as though they did. The kingdom was being experienced of the first century. They were receiving the kingdom. The kingdom was coming. They were saved. They were being saved. The salvation was coming. They were redeemed. They were being redeemed. Their redemption was coming. Luke 21, 28, Jesus said, when you see these things come to pass, know the your redemption draws nigh. He's not referencing a physical redemption there any more than it's a physical coming in Luke 21, 27, or a physical kingdom in Luke 21, 31. The redemption is complete at the second coming of Christ, which took place in the fall of the temple. 
And so the redemption is proleptical in its nature. Resurrection is uh, proleptical in its nature. And death being abolished is proleptical in its nature. Now, we want to notice a couple of things, all right? In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10, and I want you guys to get yourself um, a uh, interlinear. Where's my interlinear here? That was here just a moment ago. Uh, get yourself a parsing guide, like Hans' parsing guide. Oh, there's my interlinear. Get yourself a parsing guide. Get yourself a linguistic key to the New Testament, like Reneker and Rogers. Get yourself an interlinear, and then get yourself a uh, Greek concordance and a lexicon. And get yourself a grammar and do a little bit of study for yourself. And what you're going to discover is that there are many, many, many present tense verbs that are set forward as if they were uh, past. And 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10 is such an instance. So now notice what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 10. But has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death, New King James Version, literally abolishing death and brought life and immortality to the light through the gospel. Now, if it, if it is past tense, this has to be spiritual in nature because he sure didn't abolish death at the uh, physical death at the cross, did he? I don't think that will work. So it has to be spiritual. So those who make the accusation against us, if spiritual death is destroyed at the fall of the temple, we have universal salvation and once saved, all we saved. Well, how come it's not true then for them in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10? We're talking about a kind of death that is now abolished, the death of the covenant. The old covenant world could not obtain the forgiveness of sins through Christ. We need a new covenant, which is sprinkled by the blood of Christ, a new tabernacle sprinkled by the blood of Christ, and it has to be completed in order for a salvation to be granted to the nations. And so he abolishes death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Literally, he is abolishing death. Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, it's a present passive. Death is being destroyed. And what's the last enemy to be destroyed? Death. Not physical, biological death. Physical, biological death is not the enemy of a Christian. In Job 3 and verse 21, there were those who longed for biological death. I had a friend uh, in the church. She just died a few years ago. She was 103. From 90 onward, she wanted to die. She wanted to meet her, her, her enemy. No, she wanted to be with the Lord. Death has been destroyed. So if you were in the covenant, you can't die. Because Jesus said, he who lives and believes in me will never die. Well, that's spiritual, isn't it? Well, what's the whole goal of God? It's to get his covenant people back to his house. What did the uh, father tell the prodigal? When he had come back home and he was talking to the older brother that was uh, not very happy at his return. He says, your son, your brother who is dead is alive again. You see, the house of God, the tabernacle of God, the church of our Lord, the kingdom completed today. Christ ruling completely in his kingdom has destroyed death for those in covenant. So as long as we're in the tabernacle, in the kingdom, in the body and in the church, and the seed remains in me, I cannot die, just like in 1 John 3 and verse 9 says they cannot sin. Oh, you can leave the covenant with high-handed sin, but you cannot die in covenant with Christ if you're walking in the light, because it's way stronger than the old covenant world. And that's what it is all about. Again, so the death was being destroyed. Death was destroyed. Death was being destroyed. Death would be destroyed. They're in the kingdom, receiving the kingdom. The kingdom's coming. 
They're saved. They're being saved. Salvation is coming. They're redeemed. They're being redeemed. Redemption is coming. Does anybody see a train coming yet? <laughs> what the New Testament is all about is the transition of the covenants. It's what it's about. And if we're just consistent and read Scripture as it is intended to be read with the present tense verbs intact, you can see these things. Isn't this interesting in 1 Timothy 1? where he says, we know the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate. That was present tense at the time that Paul wrote. He goes on about the sins that the law condemned. Again, the law could condemn, it just couldn't save, just like a national civil law is with us. And that law ended, the strength of sin, which is the law, ended, then comes the end, when the temple fell. One more. And then uh, uh, we'll close for today. Let's consider the heavenly Jerusalem, the already, the not yet, the proleptical approach to the heavenly Jerusalem. So in Hebrews chapter 12, we find uh, the Hebrew writer speaking of this heavenly Jerusalem. He says in verse 22, Hebrews 12, But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, literally firstborn ones, plural, who are registered in heaven, to the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now what was made perfect here as they were coming into the heavenly Jerusalem? The spirits of just men made perfect. Now, were they made perfect in a body or without a body? Of course, their spirits are made perfect in a body, but that's a collective corporate body because there's one body. Now, that heavenly Jerusalem, which is the church, was already uh, present. However, in Revelation chapter 21, the complete revelation of the new Jerusalem is seen. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. It wasn't heaven. There's nothing wrong with the place that God dwells. There's only a place that where we dwell that needed to change in order for us to be with God. So this is coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And here's another perfect already, but not yet. They were betrothed as chaste virgins, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. And yet the marriage was coming, Revelation chapter 19, verse uh, 5 and verse 7. And what is generally given before the marriage? Well, there's an engagement ring, right? That's the Erebon, the sealing, the guarantee, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is the guarantee. It's the wedding ring. It's the promise that Jesus is coming, the spiritual gifts until the coming of Christ. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm you to the end, that you might be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. The spiritual gifts, 40 years unto the end. And that's the end of the old covenant age, not the end of the planet. So let's just review uh, very quickly of what we've already discovered. A prolepsis is the speaking about an event as if it had been already accomplished, though it was in the process of being accomplished. Proof, Romans 4, 17. He calls those things which do not exist as though they did. All right? They're in the kingdom, yes. But they're receiving the kingdom. The kingdom's coming. Not a different sense of the kingdom, a different stage of the kingdom. They were saved. They were being saved. Their salvation was coming. Not a different sense of the salvation, the same kind of uh, salvation that already had been, uh, begun. They were redeemed. They were being redeemed. Ephesians 1, 13, 14. Remember the literal concordant version. Procuring and obtaining that which had already begun. They were raised. Ephesians 2, 16. Philippians chapter 3, 16. To the degree that he'd already been raised. Not miraculous transfer tr transformation, but spiritual transformation of that body. Soon he would attain resurrection 
And when the dead ones out of Hades were raised, then resurrection status was uh, obtained by the church. Um, death was being overcome. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Present passive. By the way, there are about 10 present passive verbs in 1 Corinthians 15, which directly relate to resurrection. Get out a parsing guide. Get out a Greek New Testament. Get out an interlinear. Get out um, a grammar and do your own study. And you'll find out, in fact, that what we have been taught, that somehow Jesus already procured complete spiritual salvation and one day later our physical bodies will be redeemed so we can go to heaven is a false doctrine redemption means being bought back and why does your physical body have to be bought back when did you lose that <laughs> well we lost it in adam are you kidding me <laughs> I, i'm not even going to get get into that um uh, this morning again the already but not Yet yeah, the prolepsis in the New Testament is filled with these uh, concepts. Again, I hope this uh, helps you in your study. May God enrich your study. I hope that you'll open your mind to God's Word and you will see the reality of full salvation delivered today, that we have the full presence of Christ. Heaven is opened. No one's going to Hades anymore. We're just transitioning to the other side. We're never going to die. And that's the best news I think I've ever come to in my study of the Bible. You all have a great day, and may God enrich your studies.